心臓が止まってしまうまで私とずっといいことしましょうね私はとあることで知識を学びシータを拾った<笑>お前も遠くまで来ちまったな Hello everyone, it's me, the other. There are patches upon us in global, so why don't we take some time and just review some of the things that are coming our way? And hopefully, I can help some of you decide whether or not you want these characters. So, this time we're talking about Toa and Patsir. Overall, I'd say this patch is probably going to be skippable for the vast majority of players, as neither one of them are particularly meta changing units like Hilda, nor have either of them appeared in any future bond requirements as of yet. However, that's not to say that either of them are bad at all. So, why don't we just jump into it and take a look at Toa? Toa is the team supporting DPS. The closest comparison I would make for her is Lamford, in that her personal output is going to be moderately high at best, but she makes up for that by providing some unique support abilities for her teammates. Using her three costs, Toa can provide a stat R similar to Lamford. However, Toa can only choose to raise either your attack stats or your defense stat. At any given moment, and she actually provides no boost to magic defense. But to make up for the lack of all around stat boost like Lamford has, her auras can give some other effects. Her attack command aura essentially gives everybody a Ragnarok style effect of fixed damage before battle, and also gives cooldown reductions upon defeating enemies. Meanwhile, her defense command aura gives everybody in her aura range immunity to fixed damage and displacement. So basically, you're choosing between specializing your team around her into offense or defense at any given moment, depending on which one you choose. One other downside to this 3 cost is the fact that this 3 cost has a cooldown of 5 turns, whereas the aura actually only lasts 3 turns. She can sort of alleviate this since she has a cold blooded style move, but even with that, without some kind of outside support, she cannot keep her aura up full time. So that's something worth keeping in mind if you decide to use Toa. You shouldn't activate your aura until you know you're ready to engage or you think you're going to get engaged on. The final thing I want to note about Toa's 3C is its passive portion. Not only does it give her immunity to buff block, which is really nice for Toa because she is a very buff centric character, a lot of her mechanics involve buffs, but the passive also makes it so that anytime she has one of her auras up from this 3C, her soldiers will get physical damage taken minus 35%. This ends up making Toa one of the more bulky DPS on the physical side. However, there is an asterisk here. Since this is only physical damage taken on her soldiers, she is still pretty vulnerable to dying to direct attacks like Killing Blow from Zerida or Sigma attacking her directly. She does have decent defense since her talent gives her defense, but usually that's not enough to survive a direct hero attack from an assassin these days. Toa's physical bulkiness is very reliant on her soldiers, which by the way, she gives a 30% HP and 40% defense bonus to. So, again, very tanky soldiers, but don't make the mistake of thinking that Toa herself is super tanky. She herself is moderately tanky, but nothing incredible. So, I mentioned earlier that Toa is a buff centric character, and that starts with her talent, which gives her extra stats, attack, and defense as long as she has multiple buffs on her. She also extends the duration of buffs given to her by one. Now, this doesn't include buffs that she gives herself, but it does mean you can get some interesting things, like maybe a four turn attack blessing. From a tiaris with the teddy bear. To go along with this, Toa has a 1c cold blood style skill, which is actually used to target your allies because what it does is it copies three of her dispelled buffs onto an ally before she is allowed to move another two blocks. Now, the duration of buffs that she transfers onto an ally will always get capped at two turn durations, but nevertheless, this can open up a lot of interesting plays with Toa. Some obvious choices include, of course, giving her attack blessing or an Imelda whip. And then she can give it to another ally. The final unique thing from her kit is a 2C attack skill. Now, this skill for the most part is a pretty standard, just damaging skill that does 1.5 times damage and then does some extra damage if Toa has more buffs on her. It has another effect that says that if she has a faction buff, Toa will attack first. But perhaps the most notable aspect of this skill is that if Toa has a faction buff and the opponent does not, she will actually pierce guard with this skill. Now, this requirement is admittedly pretty stringent, especially in PvP, but it essentially allows Toa an extra avenue to contribute to the team on top of just being a walking stat stick and buff transferer. The nice thing though is that at this point in the meta, it's actually very easy for Toa to find a faction buff. Toa is in Strategic Masters, Origins of Light, and the Tensei faction. 
Now the Tensei faction of course has Hilda, and Ares is still a pretty common sight in most boxes. And while Origin of Light is not a very strong faction at this point, Juggler still features in the majority of boxes, and he can buff Toa if necessary. Finally, the Strategic Master faction is probably her weakest faction, in that not a lot of people use those units. She's also kind of redundant with Lamfert, so it'd be kind of weird to deploy them both at the same time. However, SB Ultimiller is around the corner, and he'll be seeing some play, so that'll just be another avenue for Toa to get a buff if necessary. With all this in mind, Toa actually shouldn't have any problems finding a niche in the current meta. So before I move on, I do feel the need to point out that Toa, aside from being a pretty good unit for PvP, is actually a really great unit for PvE as well. Partially for the same reason she's good in PvP, she's physically tanky, she's got team support, and she can do pretty good damage as well, and the lack of damage mods in her kit are less important in PvE. Perhaps most notably, Toa is a very good unit to have for Jormungandr, and I wouldn't really be surprised if we ended up seeing Toa in some of the teams for the top ranking in Jormungandr eventually. So as mentioned, Toa can copy buffs, so Tiaris is a pretty regular fixture in Jormungandr, so she can copy attack blessing to another team member, which of course increases the overall team's damage. And perhaps also worth noting is that her 3C defensive aura prevents fixed damage, which is a pretty regular fixture of the Jormungandr fight. And since Deedlet is a pretty common choice for Jormungandr as well, it can help knock Toa's cooldown on her 3C low enough so that she can have her aura up constantly. So overall, Toa is pretty good at both PPE and PvP. So next we can talk a bit about Patsir. If there was one character in this game so far that could be considered a gimmick character, Patsir would be it. Her skill set includes some stuff that's similar to Lestel, some stuff that's similar to Bozel, and otherwise she's just a pretty good mage type DPS character, and she even has the first ever magic guard pierce ability in the game. All of this comes with the caveat of Patsir's gimmick, which is that she is more effective against non-female units. Now her talent and skills actually do specify non-female instead of straight up male. So if we ever end up getting some robot characters or whatnot, Patsir will be effective against them as well. It also means that she is effective against the majority of the PvE bosses we run into in the game. So if you want to take her into something like say Fenrir, she will be effective against that fight. So when she satisfies the condition of fighting a non-female hero, she not only takes less damage, but she also gets a huge intelligence boost. As mentioned, she has a nice combination of both single target and AoE spells to take advantage of this. For AoE, she has Mind Bore, Forget, and her 3C. Her 3C does a significant amount of fixed damage based off her int. Now, for her 3C, her fixed damage is going to take place whether or not you're fighting a non-female unit or not. But of course, since her talent mods are int based off whether or not she's fighting a non-female unit, that means against a female unit, she will probably be doing less damage. Another interesting aspect of Patsir's 3C is the passive portion, which says that when Patsir dies, she actually does a map-wide passive disable to every single non-female enemy on the map. This lasts forever and cannot be dispelled. It can, however, be resisted. Again, it's an interesting gimmick, and pretty powerful when you think about it, but of course you need to make sure the enemy has mostly non-female units to get the most out of it. You have to make sure they don't have Rosen, you have to make sure they don't have Gospel, and of course you also have to have Patsir die, which means you're down a unit. Fits into the overall theme that Patsir has, which is that she's a pretty gimmicky character. As for single target, she has Fireball, Lightning, and Dark Reaper, and Dark Reaper of course is always a very good single target skill to have. And finally, as mentioned before, she actually has a guard pierce ability, but this only pierces guard if she is fighting a non-female unit. So basically, if there's only ladies around for a pet seer to hit, this is just going to be a very standard 1.5 times damage attack skill. So given all this, if you want to use pet seer in PvP, it's pretty important that you pick ban correctly. You want to ban as many female units as possible if you want to pick pet seer. Not to say she becomes completely useless against female units, it's just that if you're fighting a female unit, you would be better off with just about any other DPS. Another big problem with Patsir is her lack of movement. She only has 3 move, and she doesn't have any gap closers, she doesn't have any cold blood style moves, and she really doesn't have any range increasing abilities either. So if you plan on using her in mostly single target situations, a Scepter of Divinity is actually a pretty good choice for her. But overall, it's actually best to think of Patsir as more a mage type unit than an assassin unit, uh, mostly because of her lack of movement. Not a bad character at all, it's just that her applications are kinda narrow, and as far as her magic guard piercing abilities are concerned, she's going to get outdone in that aspect by Kaiura in a couple months. Pretty significantly so, Kaiura is going to be a much better 
and easy to use general purpose magic assassin. Given what we know about what's upcoming for the next several months, Patsira is probably not a super attractive unit to be investing into at the moment. Unless of course you just like the whole succubus design. You know, I, I understand. Uh, but otherwise I think we're going to need to wait for her exclusive equipment to come out to see if that can help boost her up a little bit. I would say for a lot of longtime players, the more exciting thing from this patch is going to be the new 3Cs. And more specifically of course, Bernhardt's 3C. I think a lot of people have been looking forward to this a long time, and I don't think there's a whole lot I can add at this point about Bernhardt's 3C. Now I actually did make a huge mistake when I first talked about this skill. Uh, the passive portion which does an AoE actually only occurs after Bernhardt's normal attacks. So this passive portion actually does not synergize with Sword Dance, or at the very least, they didn't want Bernhardt to be able to do two rupture ticks in a row. Nevertheless, this is a very good 3C. Aside from the obvious buff here to the Empire faction, because of course by making Bernhardt better you are indirectly buffing the entire Empire faction by giving them a more viable faction buffer. This skill in general just makes Bernhardt a very versatile character. He gets more movement, more damage, his sword dance gets bigger, his shield bash can go to 2 range, he gets hegemony after buffing himself, and if he has iron fist equipped he also has physical damage reduction. The cool thing about this 3C is how much breadth it gives him in terms of his skill loadout. In the past it was pretty much locked in that Bernhard would bring his faction buff plus sword dance plus rupture with the occasional match where he might bring iron fist, but now the rest of his kit is far more viable. So shield dash of course being 2 range is pretty useful, and shield dash has gained some relevance because Himiko can be stunned to kill her immediately with a single target attack. So a Bernhardt with Shield Dash is a pretty good deterrent to stop Himiko from just running in carelessly. Bernhardt can actually equip Hegemony now, and alongside his 3C he can actually get two buff dispels through a normal attack. This isn't something you see super often, but it actually does come up a couple times. Being able to dispel two buffs with every single attack is pretty strong, especially if you find yourself in a long drawn out fight. And even with just normal attacks, Bernhardt is going to be hitting very very hard. He has 20% damage from his talent, 15% damage from his self buff in his 3C, and his 3C faction buff of course also gives 18% damage. Add that to Bernhardt's respectable attack stat and the fact that he still has his attack defense down aura. If you bring double hegemony on Bernhardt that means you have a better chance of taking off a defense buff on an enemy. I've seen some matches where Bernhardt was able to one shot Elwin in a melee attack even though he has a class disadvantage. That's the extreme end of what Bernhardt is capable of but the fact that he can do it at all is pretty impressive. Finally, he has his Iron Fist guard skill. Now previously he did bring this once in a while if you found yourself tankless and you want to burn to tank as an emergency, uh, but with his 3C he is now genuinely a really scary physical tank. The majority of the meta physical DPS are going to have a hard time taking him out. A properly geared Bernhardt is not at all scared of Zerda using Killing Blow or Sigma dueling him. He's often not even scared of a cab ramming into him full force because he does have access to Lancer Soldiers, like Stone Colossus, and combined with the 25% physical damage reduction on his 3C, it's going to take a lot of physical hits to take him out. Of course, Bernhardt still has his biggest weakness, which is magic. He can't guard against magic, and he himself dies to magic pretty easily anyway. But of course, this can be mitigated pretty significantly in Pick Bam. Uh, but overall, Bernhardt 3C is really good. It brings him back into the meta for sure, and also brings a lot of Empire characters back into the meta now that they have another viable buffer for them. And on that note, we have a buff to another Empire character, the uh, Emerex 3C. For now, I think the most significant part of Emerex 3C is that it gives him some extra striking distance. He can use it and then move another 3 blocks in attack. However, I think the greatest application of this 3C is going to come when we get SP Ultimiller and Luna's exclusive equipment later down the line. Both of those are coming pretty soon, and both of those work really well with Emerex. So Emmerich can give someone else a 1 block movement down aura, which of course also disables guard. This is notable with SP Ultimiller and Luna for a couple reasons. This 3C works well with SP Ultimiller because if you give it to SP Ultimiller, he can use his Ares style draw in attack, and combined with his 3C act again, Ultimiller will be able to kill a lot of squishy targets. It's something of a gimmicky strategy, but it is very powerful if your opponent is careless and allows you to get both Ultimiller and Emmerich. As for Luna, it works well with her because her helm actually increases the range of auras on her by 1, 
Now obviously on the surface this was meant for Luna's magic damage resistance aura, but it does in fact work with auras given to her, like Emmerich's 3C here. So basically if you have both Emmerich and Luna, you will have access to two Emmerich style move locker units on the map. Both of these tools will be estimated to come next month, so if you're interested in using Emmerich for some of these strategies, but you haven't built them up yet, you do have a month to build them up. Now you might have noticed I did not really mention the Utter Effect in Emrex 3C, which is a more defensive type of effect, where it can remove debuffs and heal the targets when they attack. It's not a terrible effect on the surface, but it has a couple limitations on it that I feel like are not the case with the Guard Lock. So this buff makes it so that you can dispel up to 4 debuffs from yourself, and then you will heal 15% life for each debuff dispelled this way. Now this might sound useful as a counter to the debuff meta that we're running into, but perhaps the biggest problem I see with this is that it needs to be cast preemptively before you start getting debuffed in order to maximize its use. Because if the unit you want to cast it on gets buff blocked after a bozo casts a black hole or whatever, then uh, all your preparation was obviously for nothing. So you need to cast it ahead of time before you get debuffs cast on you to maximize its use. But unless that unit you are counting on is able to win the game for you, then that doesn't sound like a very useful thing to have. I don't want to say it will never be useful. I can think of some situations where it might be useful, but just thinking about the way you would have to apply it seems pretty awkward, and I really wouldn't recommend planning around this aspect of the skill. Uh, the first effect which allows you to give the Emmerich talent to another character is far more useful, in my opinion. So finally, we have Kuobara's 3C here. It's Kuobara. Stick to the anime. So now let's look at the two new pieces of exclusive equipment they're adding. Uh, first they have Moemi's hat. It gives her one extra charge on her 3C, and also makes it so that her magic garments buff will restore some life to her allies. Both of these are nice bonuses to what Noemi can already do, but this is not a helm that's going to make you go out of your way to build Noemi if you weren't already using her. Zalal also made sure to give it HP as its stat instead of defense or magic defense, so that's pretty nice. There's just not a whole lot to say here, uh, it's just an overall increase to Noemi's skills, but it's nothing game-changing like some other exclusives have been. The other piece of equipment they're adding is Melania's, and again, I don't think there's a whole lot to say here. Uh, it's just not very good. The problem with it is that the effect looks good, uh, immunity to curse, wounding, and heal block on, in a command around her, but the command is only for one block. So in order for Melania's staff to work properly, people have to form a cross shape around her, uh, if you have a 5-man team. This is obviously very limiting, and it also doesn't synergize well with her talent where you want Melania to get attacked so that the person guarding her will restore some life. Obviously this is pretty nice for the tank that is guarding her if you stand next to her. Preventing Curse Wounding and Heal Block, which are two of the most devastating things that a tank can get. Uh, but ultimately this staff isn't going to help Melania at all. She's not really going to budge from where she is in the game, which is mostly a pretty niche PvE role. I could see this possibly being useful in some arena defense teams. But aside from that, I think most people are not going to waste their time on this, and I think most people are just going to wait for Melania's 3C to see if that can help her. So that's the exclusive equipment. I'll end this by talking about some miscellaneous stuff that will be coming this patch. So of course, as they have teased, Dimensional Expedition is finally coming, and alongside that is SP Hine. I'm not going to expand on that too much. I've spoken about these two topics uh, a number of times already. If you want to hear more about them, I will link in the description below to my video about Dimensional Expedition. And as for SP Hine, uh, last month I did make a video with the assumption that SP Hine was coming. But if you just want a very very short summation of SP Hine, basically, he's pretty good. He's good in PvE, he's good in PvP, almost everybody has him at 6 stars. I think he's worth getting if you like using the Glory or Empire factions. Uh, but if you're comfortable with where your box is at, or you don't think he's going to fit well into your box, uh, SPs are a pretty big resource investment, so maybe you want to think about it a little bit before you decide whether to get him or not. We should also be getting the second Langrisser 5 time rift soon, and aside from adding more story of course, uh, the most notable thing about this time rift is that a Fury of Tear is available for free in this time rift in 18-6. So if you're short on Fury of Tears, which I think is most of us, uh, be sure to grab it. It's definitely a really nice prize. They're going to be changing the side box in Apex Arena from a 6 hero side box to a 9 hero side box. Uh, this should only be relevant to you if you're one of those players that wants to get into playoffs for Apex Arena. It's an interesting change, so we'll see if any whales take advantage of it. 
when the Season 7 playoffs come around. And the final thing they're adding this time is actually a long-delayed Sequel Realm event that we were meant to get a quite a while ago. About 8 months ago at this point, I think. Uh, but only if you are going to follow the Chinese event calendar very, very precisely. Uh, Children's Day is celebrated on a different day depending on where you are in the world. And in some places in the world it's actually still kind of confusing. Uh, but typically it is celebrated in June. So I guess they were just waiting for the appropriate month to come because of course it is June right now. Uh, but whatever the case, this is just a standard Secret Realm event with three items to trade in for various prizes. Uh, there's no Adiki stuff this time unfortunately, but there are some Wheels of Fate up for grabs. Uh, aside from that, it's kind of a lighthearted story involving Argus and Emilia. Uh, which I guess is pretty cool because honestly we don't really get to see Emilia that much. And with that, I think that's all I have for you guys today. I know even compared to some of the other recap videos I've done in the past, this is actually shorter. Uh, but I think part of that is because this time the characters really are not that interesting. They're not bad or anything, it's just that they have pretty straightforward kits, they're not going to significantly impact the meta, and overall it's a pretty skippable banner unless you just like the characters. Uh, but if you have any questions, or if you think I've missed anything, please be sure to comment below and let me know. We still haven't talked about Mu or Epsilon on this show yet, and we're going to talk about them very soon. We actually recorded that a couple weeks ago, but I haven't had as much time recently to edit videos or even the website recently. But the Mu and Epsilon video should be out soon enough. And as for the new website, because I know a lot of people are still wondering about that, uh, some of the team members actually had some real life stuff come up, so th we've been a little bit busy for the past couple weeks, but we are working on the new site still. It might just take a week or two longer than we expected it to. But we do know people are wondering about it, so don't worry, we're working on it. Sorry it's taking a little bit longer than expected, but once the site is ready, I will be sure to announce it here on this channel and of course on the website. But until then, please give us just a bit more time. Thanks for watching guys. See you guys next time.